All right, welcome back, everybody. We're going to start in on chapter three, hitting them from the outside, and this chapter is on culture. Now, take a look at the pictures that I have, and the upper left-hand corner, who is it, who is it, who is it? That's right. 80s fans, it's Culture Club. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Questions. All right, which of the following societies has the most culture? India, China, the United States, or France, or none of the above? Survey says... Oh, I knew this. It's how people have been responding for a long time. India seems uh, to be right on top uh, with images of bright colors and so many different diverse people. Um, and do you know which one is always last, as usual, for some reason? We'll talk about that. France, <laughs> right? I mean, I think it's because they smoke more, drink more, have higher cholesterol, and yet live longer. But we've always had kind of something going on with France and the United States. Obviously, this is none of the above. All cultures, right, or all societies have a great deal of culture, not necessarily more or less than another. All right, so let's start with the basics. Culture, the ways of thinking, the ways of acting, and the material objects that together form a people's way of life. I mean, that could be everything from a thought in your head to this jerry bear uh, in my son's room. <laughs> but it's how we think, how we act, and what we own, right? So it could be so many different things that encompass culture, really everything. And, and the most important thing is that culture is shared. It's a shared way of life. Even if you're a very multicultural society like we are in the United States, um, we share many different cultures in the same nation or in the same society. Um, the idea is those that those overlap and in a single society, um, very multicultural, and we certainly share those ideas. So when we're talking about culture, we've really got to distinguish between two things, thoughts and ideas and things, okay? So the ways of thinking, thoughts and ideas, mental formations, and then things, actual material objects. Question, if you had complete freedom to choose, would you rather live in the United States for the rest of your life or in some other country? So you can choose this one on your own, live in the United States, live in some other country, uh, and should be C, not sure. And a lot of people answer this because in the past, they've either have a lot of travel experience and they find out that they just really love where they were born if this was in the United States, or that they found something that they just love even more about another place, right? Doesn't mean you don't like the country that you were born in, but you know, a lot of people do find that travel really, again, like with cultural pluralism, expands your notion of what is available out there for you. All right, so these two things, like I said, we're gonna distinguish between them, and that's non-material and material culture. Thoughts and ideas and actual objects. So everything, right? The intangible world of ideas created by members of a society could be karma, kindness, uh, symbols, language, values, norms, you name it, and it includes ideas that were created by members of society, okay? Um, if I were to go around and ask you, and I will now, what's your concept of karma? What does karma mean to you? Inevitably, when I go around a classroom, people are like, you get what you deserve, what goes around comes around, if you do good things, you'll get good things. Now, generally speaking, that's not the precise cultural definition of karma for where it originated, but we do have a shared set of ideas of what that means. And so it's like our interpretation of that. And we have an idea of that, right? We also have a notion of what kindness is. When somebody says they're behaving in a kind way, and for the most part we know they're not, then, then we understand that. We're like, no, wait, that's not what I was taught is that about these ideas. And the other, <coughs> excuse me, would be material culture. So anything, right? Physical creations that members of a society make, use, and share. Um, tangible things. Corvettes. I don't even know I have Corvettes here. I'm kind of an old truck guy myself, and I might be into this area where I'm soon going to be getting into a midlife crisis, but I just don't think that uh, that a Corvette is, is in the cards for that one. Houses, cell phones, tools, and I have nooks, okay? So I'm going to tell a story here because I think this is worthwhile. Uh, nook would be like, you know, 
when a baby cries, we put it in their mouth. So what are the names that you know for those, right? Um, a binky, Baba, Nook, Passy, Pacifier. But basically, right, it's our society or culture's idea of what to do when a baby cries. You put a piece of oil or plastic that was <laughs> refined from oil, turned into plastic, in their mouth, and suddenly it's like, wah, wah, wah. And everything's all good, right? But that's just sort of how we do it now or here in sort of more modern times. So there is no one way of life that is like normal, right? Or, or for all humanity, but each culture does it different. So let's go back in time. And of course, not all Native American culture is the same. The Plains Indians much different than Northwest Coast, no, Northwest Coast Indians, or maybe Inuits and other places um, where it's really cold. But, but a general idea of, of Native Americans from the United States, a lot of times a practice was, or a practice was, in some tribes, when a baby's crying, they cover the nose, wah, wah, and cover the bone. Now, what does that accomplish? When I ask my students this, a lot of times they say, well, you can't breathe. Uh, and of course, maybe for a tiny second, but that is not at all what parents would do. Um, but it accomplishes the notion of quieting that baby. Same thing, right? S um, similar, at least, idea. Now, why might that be important for indigenous people? Um, you know, you have an idea. You might be loud, and if there's five or 10 or 20 babies crying at once, it could give away your position. It could mean that you have to go that much further to hunt the food you're looking for because of the noise. Um, so it's related to a lot of different things. It would serve a lot of different functions to be able to get a baby to stop crying quickly. Same thing in our society as far as we, we have that need, right? But if I'm sitting down at Olive Garden, I don't even know, I, don't, I haven't eaten there for years, but my partner used to work there. She used to work at Olive Garden as a server. So if we're sitting there having a dinner at Olive Garden and our baby starts crying, baby's crying, and uh, wah, wah, and I do this in the restaurant, What's going to happen and how long will it take? That's right. It'll take about, well, it'll take less than 30 seconds before at least five people in the restaurant are either filming me or calling child services and reporting abuse. Okay. Of course, we learn that culture isn't always stagnant. So maybe somebody in the 1950s would slap or smack their kid in public. Whereas if you did something like this, even though it serves a purpose, it just seems out of place culturally, out of place in society. So Who's to say that putting that piece of plastic in a baby's mouth is the only way to do it? Because certainly as we look cross-culturally, it's not. So material culture and non-material culture, ideas and things. So what are the differences between the terms culture and society? Culture, a shared way of life or social heritage, and it shapes what we do and helps form our personalities. Whatever culture you're born into and live into is gonna have a tremendous impact on who you are, who you turn out to be. And society refers to people who interact in a defined territory and share a culture. So once you're in that culture, then your society is there. Defined area and share a culture. I mean, state to state even is so very different. Even the top of Illinois where I'm from by Chicago to Southern Illinois, which is real South, seeming is very different. So neither society nor culture um, could exist without the other. And there's a, a reciprocal interplay, obviously. All right. Question. Do you believe that the U.S. culture is superior to that of most other countries? Yes, no, or not sure. Um, and whatever is your answer, we have this idea down below that, you know, we create culture and only humans rely on culture rather than instincts to ensure our survival. And that's why a lot of the stuff that we're gonna learn, the information we're gonna learn this semester in sociology is so critical for how we interact with people every single day. Because although we don't know it, we have been learning culture since the moment we're born and that helps us to survive, right? All right, is culture stagnant? Um, I said this in the very first video, and the answer to that is no, right? It does not stay the same. Sometimes it changes really fast, and sometimes that change on certain levels seems really, really excruciating, excruciatingly slow. So why might that be? Why does it fast forward sometimes? Why does it stay the same and kind of get in a rut for a while? How does it change? What are the catalysts that bring about that change? 
So I've got a couple musician photos here. One is kind of a classic Elvis thing. The other down below is Axl Rose from Guns N' Roses in his prime. And I guess my question would be for us to think about what are some differences between culture today and in the 1950s? And you have to think about it this way. I mean, first of all, when they showed Elvis on TV, they only showed him from his waist up, kind of like what I'm doing here, right? Because they thought that his music was so African-American, it was black music, and right then the country was struggling with that big time, that if he went on there and started to shake his hips, it would lead to the ruin of all white women and girls everywhere. And I say this as a joke, but that's truly society was like trying to grasp black music and wrap their heads around it. You have got a white guy from the South, Elvis, who is playing primarily black music and they wouldn't even show him. And if you see the footage of the crowds, girls are passing out and they're screaming and it's really the beginning of rock and roll, which is a tremendously powerful movement in society even now. But back then, People didn't even know how to behave. That's why the Beatles stopped touring. They just couldn't hear each other on stage because people were screaming the entire time. They just weren't used to concerts, right? So how's that different? They can't even show them from the waist up. You Then all of a sudden in the 80s, you've got Axl Rose, who is usually just wearing hot pants, usually not wearing a shirt, and his behavior on stage would be so much different, right? Um, and it's perceived so much different by people in the 50s. All right, other common things. If you're in a classroom and you're wearing pants and you identify as the gender female, that just wasn't done in the 50s for the most part. And if you were in this classroom, that was only accessible to a few people and not always who were women. I remember my grandma got one of the first majors from Iowa State University, and the only thing you could major in there at the time was home economics, right? So gender roles are different, how we interact in society, music and arts and culture and race relations. Let's 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 do a you know an experiment. And this will tell us just how much things have changed. All right. So I'm gonna text my wife right now, and here she is. Brought her up right there. And I'm gonna talk in text because that'll be the easiest way. Julie, I've had a really long, tiring day, and I want you to have dinner ready when I get home because I'm the man of the house. And it's your job to cook dinner so I can relax because I am the main provider for our family. And that's a very tough job, period. Also, make sure to have a beer ready for me and that all the chores in the house are done and that it's clean. All right. I'm going to send. I'm going to press send. I'm going to do it. Here we go. <laughs> Oh, no. It's funny because even though I can't see you, I just heard everybody go, ah, no, don't. Don't send that text. Why not send that text? Because we know that culture has changed so much that just that little text right there, I don't even know if I've really got a home that the locks haven't been changed and I can actually come home to at night if I send that. Gender roles are different. How men and women interact is tremendously different. What are the expectations once women went to work and now we've got everybody working so much that our roles around the houses have changed? Anyway, so you get the idea and it only takes an example like that for us to know just how much in a small amount of time culture has really changed. All right, there are common components that all cultures share. Although every culture varies greatly, these are the ones that they all share. Good test question, right? Symbols, languages, values, and norms. And I think that we'll get into this next time. Um, we'll start with this for episode two. All right, everybody. Um, whew, I'm gonna have to send a quick text to my partner and let her know that I was recording a video for my class and I'll make dinner. <laughs> all right, do me a favor. Reach out if you need anything and that's right, uh, be good people and do good things. Peace, everybody.